Hey everyone, welcome back to our beginner tutorial on how to design a set of headphones within Gravity Sketch. Last time we ended up with this cleaner sketch and today we're going to talk a little bit about surfacing. Gravity Sketch has quite a few different options for surfacing, but today we're going to focus on a beginner workflow for subdivision surfaces. But before I get into that, I want to make sure that my room is nice and clean and simple. I'm going to go down here to my layer tab and I want to make sure that all of my existing objects are on their own layers and those layers are locked. This will prevent me from accidentally manipulating or moving those objects while I'm creating surfaces. You can see here, unlocked, I can move it. And then once I lock that object, now I can no longer move it. The last thing I want while creating a new surface is to accidentally move my reference sketch or reference object away from where it originally was. And because of that, I need to make a new layer and I'll call this layer initial surfacing. Again, this is a pretty rough version of surfacing, but definitely helpful for beginners. We'll go into a more advanced version later on. But let's get kicked off with some surfaces. So again, I'm gonna go into my brush menu and we have quite a few options here in terms of surfacing. For now, let's talk about quilt surfacing. So that first tool is called the quilt tool. And you can think about this like the ink tool of surfaces. When I hold down my non-drawing hand index trigger and my drawing hand index trigger at the same time, it'll create a surface that just basically takes up the space that I move my hands through. When I go into edit mode, you can see there are quite a few points, a lot like the ink tool. I can still edit and manipulate these points, but it's not the most effective when it comes time to refine and edit the surface. As for our other surfacing tools here in the brush menu, we have quite a few. We've got precise quilt, sheet, low poly, round, and square. If we think of the quilt tool as the ink version of surfaces, then precise quilt is the point stroke version of surfaces, just a bit more refined, a bit easier to use. And a lot of that comes down to this input mode. We also have the other versions, sheet, low poly, but what's a little bit different is this round tool. So when we start this round tool, we'll see an axis pops up in the middle of our scene, and any time that we hold down the index trigger and move our controller through space, we're creating a revolve that goes around that axis. If I want to move that axis, all I have to do is hold down my non-drawing hand index trigger, and that allows me to reposition that axis. You'll notice when I hold it down all the way, my trigger turns completely blue, but if I only hold it down halfway, it turns to this light blue. That half pool allows me to snap that axis to different increments of 45 or the major axes. With this in mind, I'm going to switch my axis of this revolve by half clicking and making it turn red. Now I know that that is perpendicular to my mirror plane. By clicking down, I can make a very simple, very quick, perfect circle. In this case, I'm gonna turn that to a bright red and I'm going to use these as actual guides because I know that I want this sketch to be a perfect pill shape. This is going to help me quite a bit when I go into surfacing to make sure that I'm creating a perfect pill shape with actual circles as the end terminations. And there are multiple perfect circles and pill shapes in this design. So just to help visually keep everything aligned to those guides, I'm going to duplicate these circles down and use them later on when I'm surfacing to find termination points. And like we talked about earlier with keeping the room clean, I'm going to make a new layer, I'm going to name this guides, and then I'm going to drop those objects onto this layer and lock it so that these guides are pure, they are kept where they're supposed to be, and I can use them as reference moving forward. With that done, I'll go back into my layers and click on initial surface just to make sure that's my active layer. I'll also go through here into sketching aid and turn on my mirror plane. With all of that done, let's get back to some surfacing tips. We talked a little bit already about the quilt and precise quilt tools, but one of my personal favorites and that I think is very helpful for beginners is the low poly tool. The first thing I'm going to do is go here into the menu and turn it to point mode. And now the way that works is that when I hold down my non-drawing hand trigger, I get a preview. Every time I click with my drawing hand trigger, I get to actually see that surface extend to that next point. This is much easier to manipulate and edit than the quilt tool because it doesn't have all those unnecessary points. It's as simple as can be. So we're gonna use that tool as we get into surfacing these headphones. I'm gonna zoom in here to one side. I'm gonna to go to my layers, turn down the guides opacity so that I don't have to overlook them, but they're still there and I can still see them. Then by holding down my non-drawing hand trigger and clicking with my drawing hand trigger, I can build out the rest of the surface, and when I'm done, just release both index triggers at the same time to bake that surface. We'll go into edit mode like we would with any other object by grabbing it and then clicking that blue button on our non-drawing hand. 
Now I can grab an edge as if it's an object, hold it, and duplicate it outward. When I duplicate this edge, it'll create a continuation of that surface out to the next set of points where I drop it. The idea is to just manually grab and align these points to the rough position of our blueprint. Uh, our blueprint wireframe is the sketch that we've already made. So I'm just going to go through and move each of these points until it looks like a low poly version of the surface that I'm trying to achieve. If you're new to subdivision workflows, thinking through low poly could be a little bit confusing at first, but we try to build everything out as simple as possible. And then in our edit menu, we'll turn on this subdivision level. When we click that to on, it'll smooth out that surface using those points that we created as theoreticals to drive the curvature. We can increase the subdivision level through this slider here to make the surface smoother and smoother, but that also adds more data and adds more technical geometry. I'll toggle these subdivision levels on and off all the way back down to low poly because it's easier to check my topology in low poly mode, but much easier to check highlights, tracking, and make sure that all of my surface is transitioning the way I want to when I'm in fully subdivided versions. For instance, if you look back at my original sketch, I had a bit of concavity in this surface that I showed a cross section or an edge line to walk us through. If I take this hollow dot and I click with my index trigger somewhere on this surface, it'll add an edge loop. That means we now have a full edge that runs all the way along this surface in addition to the ones on the inside and outside. I can push and pull each of these new edges to change my surface, but if I want it to be a consistent change, what I'll do is turn on auto select edge loops and now you'll notice when I hover over these edges, it selects a full line. So that whole edge loop is now being automatically selected. And when I push this all in at once, which I will do with Smart Move, again, that's the gesture where you line your controllers up in line with one another. You can see here it's on the blue, the red, or if I move this way on the green axis, I'm going to use the red because I want to push that inward. And when I do that, it'll move the entire edge loop and start to create that concavity in that surface that I was looking for all along. And now when I rotate around the object and move my user, I can start to see, especially if I turn off the guides here, the way that that surface transitions can continually change it, update it, make improvements and adjustments. And because there's not too much geometry in terms of those vertices, it'll actually change relatively quickly and stay relatively clean. If I'm having a little bit of difficulty seeing the way that surface is acting, I can always go back to settings, workspace, and grab my flashlight like we talked about before to check the way that those lights track over my object. Whether you're designing a car, a shoe, or a product like we have here, tracking these highlights is really important in terms of actually understanding your geometry and your form development. But I'm pretty happy with my general surface that I have here, so again I'll go into edit mode, and if I grab these points and pull them over, you'll see I can move those points close enough to another that it'll actually snap together and create an extension of that surface. So here when I snap these points, I'm just duplicating the edge, moving it over, snapping the points to where they touch, and once they touch, it'll snap that surface closed and create uh, a closed extension of that surface. Just to make it easier to see, I'm going to lower the opacity of my sketch real quick here so that I can really focus on the way that this surface is moving around through that extension. In this case, I'm not super happy with this topology, so I'll grab that face and just delete it out. And now I can re-extrude and recreate that edges. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to make sure that that inside edge continues in that pill shape, and this is a better topological way of approaching that. So just grabbing that point, snapping it on top of the other, and this is more of a theory side of sub D, but you always want to make sure that your faces have four sides. You want to make sure that you're working with polygons, not n-gons. N-gons refer to any surface that has a number of sides more or less than four. Four is the magic number here. Try to keep that in mind. But topology is a subject that we can go really deep on, and there's a lot there. So for beginners, we'll just keep it at that, and we'll move into that in another video. In terms of this specific surface, I have a pretty soft round coming along this edge. So if I go in here with my tip and I add another edge loop there, you can see that the new edge loop adds just a little bit more pinch to where that surface is coming in. If I add another, it makes it a much sharper edge. 
So this is another thing to keep in mind for subdivision. It's all about density of your points. We call that mesh density or density of vertices. There are a few different terms for it, but the idea here is that if you have fewer points in one area, it's going to be smoother. If you have more points in one area, it's going to be sharper. But I'm going to enable auto select edge loops and duplicate out this thickness just to make it feel a little bit more substantial and less like a floating surface. Now, because I have three edges right there, it's creating a sharper edge for the surface to roll around the backside. While we're on the topic of thickness, if I go into edit mode on a subdivision surface, you'll notice in my menu, there's a little tab over here to the right called thicken and offset. If I turn that on, I can give thickness to any of my surface geometry. These little yellow arrows will actually move and we can change it from thicken, offset, or bake. And what this allows us to do is just add physical geometry to this surface. So I can move these arrows in or out. You'll see that little number over there on the side will show the thickness that I'm actually applying to it. And this is again, just a great way to give yourself a visual edge or make a surface printable if you wanna go down manufacturing and prototyping routes. Like I've said in previous videos, I'm a big fan of not recreating work for no reason and keeping things cleanly. So I'm gonna smart move duplicate this piece outward and then I'm going to edit this part and delete as many of those extra vertices as possible. My goal here is to get the same exact outline from this piece I've already made for a much simpler inside piece that goes between the pad and the actual outside of the headphones itself. So I'm gonna turn on auto select edge loops. I'm gonna grab this border, duplicate it inward, and then delete out these extra edges. And now what I'm left with is basically the outline of that inside piece. I'm gonna take these edges and just pull them up until those dots snap together and create a continuous edge. And now what I'm left with is this kind of oval pill shape that I can use as the inside kind of connector piece between the outer surface and the inner soft pad. And when we smart move that back into place, it's pretty obvious that this is direct connection to that outer surface. It's clean, it's aligned, it's simple. Now I want to add a little bit of concavity in this surface. So the same way I did it on the outside surface, I'm gonna add an edge loop in here, turn on auto select edge loops, and then I'm just gonna grab that inside edge loop scale it down a little bit using smart move. And when I do that, it'll create that same concavity in the shape that I had on that exterior component and just a nice uniform lead in. Next up, I'm gonna make the soft foam pad. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide my reference head and follow that exact same process. So I know that I want these edges to be kind of coincident. So again, I'm just duplicating that part outward duplicating the edge using auto select edge loops inward and making a really simple pad just by pulling those edge loops in, scaling them out, scaling them down, moving them back to give a little bit of that plush kind of vision and approach to the surface. Then I can delete some of these edge loops, move it back in, scale it down. So there's a little bit of a lead in. I might add an extra edge there to make it just a little bit sharper. But now I have a really simple foam pad. So I can go through my material shader, turn that something like clay or basic, and that's gonna be a little bit less reflective than the gloss that I have on the exterior. I'm also going to make a new surface to add just a little bit of a visual backer here. Nothing actual form indication, but just turn that to a flat shader so it acts as a backdrop for what would eventually be that fabric within the actual headphone itself. And now all that's really left is the rest of this headband so I'm gonna go back to my silver material, take my surface, and using low poly mode, I'm just gonna build out a really simple, very low poly band that's gonna go up across this edge. Surfaces work the same way stroke does when I'm across a mirror plane. I can just move those points until they're locked. That little lock icon means that they're going across the mirror plane, which means that when I turn on subdivision, it'll actually make that a smooth transition from one side to the other. And using all the things we just talked through, duplicating edges, rescaling them, moving those individual points, I can start to build out where I wanted the rest of this band to kind of interact with the speaker portion of the headphones. So I'm just manually moving these points, trying to get it to look like my design intent, playing around with the subdivision level, and realigning everything up. You can get as detailed or as rough as you want to throughout this process. I tend to be a little bit more detailed, sometimes to a fault, 
So here I'm just trying to make this a round pill and probably just call it there. Uh, that gives me my main surface that I want for the band and I can move on to the next part of refinement. I'm gonna give that band a little bit of material thickness using the thickening tool that we talked about previously. And then I'll move on to some of the more detailed parts of this, like the button that I originally wanted to put here in the side. I had some sketches with a circle here, kind of a pill shape. Maybe that's the interface of how to turn on and off your music. Maybe the pill is a microphone portion that pops out and rotates down. Uh, one thing that I wanted to do for sure is this top portion add a little bit of a user interface screen here that shows what music you're listening to. And I think that that's a compelling idea. So let's go ahead and make that. The best way to do that is I'm gonna take this main strap, I'm gonna duplicate it upwards. And now this offset surface, I'm gonna manipulate and delete certain portions of so that it becomes pretty much just that, an offset surface. In order to make it easier to see, I'm gonna turn it to a reflective black so that it kind of gives that vibe of a black screen. Uh, turn the color down and then manually move these points inward to create kind of a consistent offset um, between the band itself and this inset screen portion. So very similar to what you saw me just do with the band. We're just moving these points around. Maybe I'll add an edge loop here in the middle to make sure that that pill shape at the bottom is closer to an actual pill shape. But I'll go up to the top here and kind of manually move and manipulate these edges in or out so that I have this offset surface that kind of indicates a screen on that band. As for the pad on the band for your head, I'm gonna go ahead and go in there, add some thickness to a duplicate of the band, thicken that pretty wide, and then bake that thickness. What baking that thickness does is it makes it so that, that geometry is actual subdivision geometry. So it gives me a softer, more round form. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that to the same color as the pads, which I can either do by picking the color manually or while I'm in the color wheel, I can pull my eyedropper out to the side, put it onto an object in the room, and click the index trigger to pull that specific color. Now I can smart move that object back down into place, and I've got a pad around the band of my headphones. If I go in and turn my head reference back on, I can start to see what this set of headphones really looks like within context. I can also make a new layer, and in this case, I'll call this notes. Now I can sketch over top of this concept maybe change to red ink like we've got here. I'll change that to flat. And I can kind of leave notes for myself or if I'm in a collaborative room with someone else, we can leave notes for each other. And so I can use a combination of the ink tool. And we also, in our brush menu, have this text button down here at the bottom. So when that's active, all I have to do is click in the physical space. It'll bring up this keyboard and I can type out different options to leave uh, notes that are easier to read than if I had just written them out with the stroke tool. This is where we get to the cyclical part of design, where we've kind of built out this sketch model, we've built out this sketch, and now we're kind of iterating on it. In this case, maybe I want to add a part line right here. Maybe I want to have some thoughts shared on how that user interface and that screen would look that rotates up around the crown of the head. Maybe I want to show kind of the album cover art right here in a small circle on that screen, or even up top, Maybe I want to have some active animations that cover through this screen and change with the music being played. So maybe it's like little lines to show the actual sound waves of the music that's being played all throughout. This is where we get more into the actual product design and doing the iterative process associated with that. But within Gravity Sketch, we can think through that. We can share that information with each other. And we can start to have a more informed, rational conversation around the nuances of our design. If I turn off those notes and turn back on my line work, what I'm left with is this really nice kind of sketch rendered version of a 3D model. And now that I've finished with my sketch, I'm gonna increase the size of my grab sphere. Again, I do that by moving up or down with my thumbstick on my drawing hand. And I'm just gonna grab every object associated with my headphones, and while I have that grabbed, I'm going to click these purple hexagons on my non-drawing hand. What that does is it groups the object. So now they're all highlighted in purple. That's because they're all grouped together. Anytime I move one, they all come along with it. So this is important just to make sure everything's coming together. And now I can duplicate out multiple versions of this sketch, and I can evaluate things like color material finish. If I zoom in here to these individual sketches, 
I can grab them all and hit that purple button to ungroup. And now I can change the color of each of these pieces. In this case, I'm gonna take the silver and I'm gonna turn it all to this kind of brighter white because what's a pair of headphones without a white CMF option? Again, ungroup it. In this one, I'm gonna to go to hmm, maybe like a cool steel blue. I think that's kind of cool. So let's look at that as a CMF option. And then for the last one, again, ungroup, pick the individual piece. Let's make this one kind of a, a darker gray, almost like a, like a space gray finish. Because if we don't have white and we don't have black, it's not really a true consumer tech product. But now we can use this as a way to evaluate those different colorways, those different versions. And we can think about that in real time as we're meeting with either another designer or our ultimate client. So now over the past few videos, we've gone from knowing nothing about Gravity Sketch to having rough sketches, refined sketches, and ultimately a simplistic surface version of a final concept. As far as the beginner tutorial goes, this is really the end of it. You guys have started from nothing and now you're left with something that you can continue to work with, whether you're gonna export that into another program or continue working on it in Gravity Sketch. All that being said, there's still plenty to learn in terms of advanced workflows. So in the next video, we'll be shifting to that. We'll be focusing on cleaner modeling workflows and how to do that through the same lens of this set of headphones. So if you want something that looks like this final model we have here, you'll figure out how to do that in the next video. Thanks everyone for watching. See you next time.